Welcome to In Search of Black Power. I'm Lawrence Grand Prix, Director of Research for Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. I'm Rashim, Independent Scholar and Researcher. So there are a few things more personal than decisions parents make around disciplining their children, specifically to use physical discipline or not. However, there's a larger conversation in the Black community around the larger communal impacts and the politics of this culture of physical discipline around black youth and black adults. So both Rasheem and I have read a book by Dr. Stacey Patton entitled Spare the Kids, Why Whooping Children Won't Save Black America. Full disclosure, I am not a parent, Rasheem is. But the larger communal political implications of these dynamics impact the entire community. So today we wanted to raise the question, how does the legacy of slavery extend to the politics of physical discipline against children and black people. So Rasheem, uh, we want you to lead us through this conversation, giving your unique experience. Yeah. Of, uh, of being a mom. <laughs> and studying this stuff and right, right, social right, work right. and having that's, a PhD and that's all valid. these things. Okay, around. okay. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Uh, yeah, I, I love the way that you that you set it up. Um, because it's really important to to know that as we're having this conversation, one of the things that we really want to do is look at the historical context. Uh, behind how we view and uh, punish black youth, not only the historical context, we'll talk a little bit about the religious context of uh, how we punish uh, and look at uh, black youth, as well as social and then some things in popular culture, as well as how the state and what may be some interconnectedness there. So, and as the pushing off point, we are referencing, of course, the Spare the Kids book by Dr. Patton. So, in, in uh, starting off with the historical approach, one of the things that we're starting it off with is looking at the post-traumatic slave syndrome, that book by, I'm going to let you pronounce the name. Joy DeGruy. Right, because I, I always... <laughs> also, DeGruy Leary, I think at some point her name was um, hyphenated. Right. Um, so we're going to kind of start it uh, there, right? And one of the quotes that I want to use to start off is... Uh, it was an acceptable and expected practice in African-American communities to severely beat unruly boys so they would never make the mistake of standing their ground with a white person in authority. So this account, of course, is showcases the uh, transmission of trauma from slavery continuing into the 20th century. A lot of uh, some of the conversations that even uh, Dr. Patton had, has had with parents in her interviewing is that folks are um, punishing their, their youth physically for the purpose of protection. Um, and also, let me back up a little bit and not necessarily assume that everyone um, is familiar with post-traumatic slave syndrome, and I'm just gonna read very directly what that is. So post-traumatic slave syndrome uh, is basically a theory and it explains the adaptive survival behaviors in African-American communities throughout the United States and the diaspora. Um, some of the common themes that come up in her book are uh, multi-generational maladaptive behaviors and some of what is what that is exploring and specifically to this context are ways in which uh, parents adapted certain behaviors for again the protection of their child. Uh, some of the most successful enslaved African uh, parents were considered successful if if they had if they were able to create uh, more adaptive, more uh, amenable slaves themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is a itself an adaptive behavior. What that requires is things like breaking their child's uh, will to resist also teaching them their inferior place and making sure that they stay in it and sort of cultivating this fear around, um, around not behaving outside of uh, the context of what, what they've been socialized to do. Yeah, yeah. And it made me think about some of the experiences I've had, not as a parent, but as folks doing political work in community. This comes up when folks are talking about... Um, 
dealing with young people in community that are perceived as perhaps being a little bit deviant. And sometimes, some folks, oftentimes a little bit older, they say things like, we need to have more support for our youth, but they never seem to want to fund that. So in lieu of those things, we need to send some of these kids to jail because as bad as it is in prison, at least they're not getting shot or stabbed or getting high out here on the streets. And I think subconsciously, these people know all types of horrible things happen in jail. Mm. But it's one of the few experiences of care mm. that we can actually leverage mm. based upon the political economy we have around us. Yeah. Because unfortunately, I think part of what I take Dr. DeGruy to be saying is that we've often conflated care with violence because of our unique historical condition. So having someone lock your kid up becomes a weird act of care because mm -hmm. it's the only lever you can pull that actually the society recognizes it when you pull it. So as a person doing work in community, I think these are larger political implications of these parental, parental communal dynamics. Because as we also know, African peoples don't limit a sense of paternal or maternal care to their biological kin alone. Mm -hmm. They see themselves having this role for the larger community, which right. oftentimes can unfortunately uh, lead to uh, a view of extending uh, corrective violence through, you know, the collective discipline of, you know, you, you see somebody acting up, and you, you don't got to be your mother. It can be someone else in the right. that slap you upside the head. Right, right, right. That unfortunately, I think, has sometimes been co-opted into, well, what we can do is put them in jail. And if they're on drugs, at least they're more likely to be clean behind bars. Yeah. And so I think these are some of the large political implications of these parental parenting dynamics. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I also feel like there is that um, in, some internalized racism around black bodies being inherently bad or evil and need to be need to have it punished or disciplined out of them, um, out of them. Uh, particularly when it comes to youth, there's this adultification of youth that happens, and adultification is just basically viewing youth as a lot more mature, a lot more older than what they are. Some of the implications or some of the ways in which that shows up uh, with boys, uh, they are sentenced uh, harsher, they are viewed as uh, older than what they actually are, with, and they're also viewed as like a, a whole lot more of a threat. Mm -hmm. Uh, with girls, they are hypersexualized, or they fast, or they grown, and all of these, all of this adultification just seems to to do this work of like just justifying, uh, in a lot of ways, mal maltreatment. So, of course, one of the more popular examples of this is uh, Tamir Rice killed by the state in a playground, in a playground where like he context appropriate, environmentally appropriate, 12 year old, mm -hmm. playing in a playground, playing with a toy gun, uh, shot by police. Yeah, um, when you read the cop who shot Mike Brown, you know, Mike Brown's a young person, teenager, I believe, and the way they talk about him, he literally says, it's like, I saw Hulk Hogan when I saw him. Wow. So this hulking specimen of uh, black masculinity gets not just transmuted into adult, but gets transmuted into threat. And I think because of that, again, the communal parental unit of the black community says, we know our black kids are seen as threats. Yeah. They have to be especially attuned how to behave to avoid these ramifications, right? So it becomes, you know, my father was a cop, so he gave me the talk in terms of if you get pulled over, yeah. be very respectful, keep your hands where they can see them, be very calm. And I remember this when I was probably like 11, mm. you know? So understanding that there is a fear, and this is a huge part of the conversation around Dr. Patton's book. Well, it's like, well, if we don't apply physical discipline, they're gonna go around thinking they can do everything that white people can do and therefore they can be subject to violence, right? Right. And the white freedom that, you know, white parents give their kids is because they're gonna have white supremacy. Yeah. So they need to feel affirmed in their ability to operationalize white supremacy. So you don't need to have supplies much physical discipline, even though white parents do apply physical discipline, but just less so at the higher class levels. Mm -hmm. Black more upper class people also they spank more than white upper class people, and that mm -hmm. tends to be the big distinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um so I think sometimes people fear that, like, you know, it's the physical discipline that makes, lack of physical discipline that makes black kids act out. Right. When I think Patton's book argues it could easily be the opposite. Right. That when you're subject to physical discipline, you feel a sense of hopelessness and 
a capriciousness because you don't know when you're going to get hit or not. So it's like, well, people's already at me, so I might as well wild out. Right. You know, so we end up perhaps incubating the exact behaviors that we're trying to deter with this culture of physical discipline. Well, one of the things she also says is, you know, if if uh, whipping or beating or spanking black kids was the key, we would have, you know, we'd be, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that it wouldn't be increasing crime. It wouldn't be all, all of these these whippings and beatings and spankings, however we categorize it, supposed to de- decrease uh, a lot of these behaviors, but mm-hmm. uh, we don't actually see a decrease. I'll tell you too, uh, one of the things that came up in a study that I did of black mothers, when they talked about their black sons, uh, it was one of the first times that I that I saw uh, that I saw this difference in maleness through the eyes of a black mother mm-hmm. in a way in which uh, there's a way in which okay we 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 understand male privilege and and white privilege and that sort of thing. There was this way in which black mothers referred or talked about their black sons that made it seem that it wasn't it wasn't for them as mothers wasn't that that their uh their maleness overlaid with their blackness made them more like of a liability. Mm-hmm. They were concerned, mm-hmm. they were like hyper concerned about their safety. They were hyper vigilant mm-hmm. um, about that sort of thing and hyper aware and wanting them to like uh, protect them, yeah. protect them in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's the famous quote, we um, raise our daughters and love our sons. Right. Right. So the idea of that is that there's like an understandable role that we are socializing young women into when with men, we don't know what to do with them. So we just love on them and hope for the best. Yeah. Right. And I think that that relates to the rise of the service economy, the fall off of, you know, uh, construction and manual labor. Mm. So there are these shifts in the economy that make it so that, like, I mean, my mother and aunts tell me as such. It's like, I know where to get a young woman a job. I don't know where to get a young man a job. Mm. Because, you know, as what we've talked about, like, there were things like minority set-asides that demanded a certain percent of all federal construction went to minority contractors. And that mm-hmm. employed thousands of people in relatively well-paid manual labor jobs. So independent of the steelworks shutting down, there were actual political interventions like the Black Caucus and Perrin Mitchell made to give young black men an economic space. And that's kind of been uh, taken away mm. um, in terms of the current political economy. So I think there are lots of other things going on with this conversation. And one of the things that goes on in this conversation is what are some of the historical antecedents, the historical precedents for this behavior that we're seeing? And one of the points that Dr. Patton makes, which I think is especially important to communicate to the Black Power Media audience, is that as folks who call themselves Pan-African or African-centered, um, she makes the argument that there isn't a strong historical documented a pattern of physical discipline in African cultures, especially Mm pre-colonial African cultures. So I did actually want to read a quote um, from Dr. Pay, and it is somewhat long, but I think it's important to have some of the context and nuance she puts into the book. I can't obviously do credit to all of it, Mm -hmm. but actually kind of give, lay out her argument in terms of what were some of the parental patterns pre-colonization and how that relates to what we're seeing today. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Patton writes, quote, There was little concern in colonial America about child maltreatment, which meant that many abused children went without protection. As children were considered property, their parents were allowed to treat them as they saw fit. Unlike many Native American children who were not physically punished by their parents and were encouraged to be autonomous, misbehaving Puritan kids were branded, sentenced to hard labor, tied to wooden posts and beaten with whips, canes, switches, and paddles. The European approach to child discipline was quite different from what was common in pre-colonial West African cultures. There is no one generalized pan-continental statement that can be made about child discipline practice in Africa prior to the arrival of Europeans. Because Africans rely so heavily on oral traditions, we lack written historical documentation about the firsthand experiences of growing up parental practices prior to the Atlantic slave trade and European colonization. Despite the lack of historical documentation of pre-colonial Africa, in 1941, Herskovitz wrote a book titled The Myth of the Negro Past, in which he rejected the idea that black people adopted whooping kids from their slave masters. He claimed that whooping children was an integral part of child training in West Africa. Herskovitz wrote, in Dahomey and among the Yoruba, flogging of an order of severity almost unknown in Europe, except as a penal device, was the rule. Not only did Herskovitz not cite historical sources for his claim, he was, in fact, 
that causal visitor doing his anthropological work in Dahomey and parts of southern Nigeria in the 1930s and colonized communities with European contact, military aggression, labor exploitation, and the influence of Christianity and missionary schools had created profound cultural changes. Mm. To get more sound answers about parental practices back then, I turned to scholars who know better. One can be pretty sure that aggressive punishment against children in West Africa was unthinkable. The anthropologist Murray Lass told me in a private phone interview. Lass, a professor emeritus of University College London and foremost authority on pre-colonial West African societies, has studied historical and contemporary use of violent cultures of punishment in northern Nigeria. To beat children was considered absurd, he said. You might want to be an adult for some infractions, but being a child diminished you because as an adult, it's older and more powerful. Last said that according to the historical records of the 19th century, even adult slaves in Nigeria were not mistreated with ritualistic whoopings. If a slave consistently did something unacceptable, he was sold for export. Merely being sold was unpleasant for the slave. Children, in turn, could readily abandon their families as for unjust in behavior towards them. Another expert, Heidi Nast, agreed that there was no singular way of parenting in those cultures. It depends on the geopolitical economy where they were captured from. Where they were obtained from the forest, was they were hunter-gatherers, Nass said. These societies emphasized farming and sharing. There was no property ownership or oppressive hierarchies. West African society held children in a much higher regard than slave societies in the Atlantic world, which placed an emphasis on black bodies as property, not human beings. In West African society, infant mortality was high. Because parents feared losing their children to early deaths, they were highly valued as sacred. Unlike in Western societies that emphasized an innate wickedness of children, Africans believed that children, especially the youngest, came from the afterlife and led profoundly spiritual lives. Adults believed mm. children had extraordinary mystical powers that could be harnessed through ritual practices for the good of the community. Mm. So the quote goes on, but I think mm -hmm. that that's just some good context to add to the conversation because you, you do hear sometimes that the African-centered community is all about inculcating discipline. Mm -hmm. And part of that discipline to raise warriors is the possibility of physical discipline being part of that practice. And the idea that that being an example of injected oppression mm -hmm. and sort of recognizing that this isn't a natural container for those values of discipline and that just physical discipline itself doesn't produce a disciplined child. Mm -hmm. One that's actually able to use internalized self-discipline to help the community. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the theory per se of West African communities. I think really adds something important to the conversation in terms yeah. of what is natural cultural practice and what is injected oppression. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like it definitely highlights uh, that it that it's not something that's necessarily inherent, right? It, that's, it seems like it's more or less like part of that mal adult mal adaptive behaviors, whether that's physically physically punishing uh, your child or um, some more examples in more recent popular popular culture where parents are again. Uh, how did I, I think one time you reference it and mistaking love for Different, violence? Yeah, violence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. So some of those examples, and I, I first heard Dr. Patton say the term uh, "parent to prison pipeline." We hear often of school to prison pipeline, but she referenced something called parent to prison pipeline, and it's basically the social and emotional conditioning of parent uh, of parents to their children um, around and and conditioning them around confinement and in some of the ways in which they're punished. So we're going to show two videos. Um, and these are basically examples of like one, a mom, she makes a makeshift jail for her son. Um, and another one is where you just basically see youth being, I guess you could say the term scared straight. They are introduced and shown in what it would be like to be in jail. They are yelled at. They are put in that environment so that they can see what prison conditions uh, exactly are. M.A. Johnson, what is your number? 0804-2007. As you see, he has his socks and drawers. He has his towel and hygiene. He will be only coming out for what? Okay. Basically, you're on restriction. Jail, y'all don't get to have fun. You get to come out to eat. Wash and 
you get to go to school. Other than that, you will be confined to this cell of yours. So think about what you've done and what you've been doing. The only way you get your privileges is when we see the improvements. These kids are serving a sentence handed down, believe it or not, by their very own parents. The parents have gotten to a point that they say, I need help, and I'm willing to come to law enforcement to get help. It's called Consider the Consequences, a controversial program in Bibb County, Georgia, that first gained national attention when this video went viral of Judge Verda Colvin delivering a stern warning to kids about what life is like behind bars. Is that what you want for your lives? Come on! Somebody raping you in the middle of the night because you're the new meat on the block. That's the reality. Consider the consequences at its basic level is an attention grabber for kids who've gone awry. Kids who their parents can't connect with them anymore. Stop acting like you're trash. Care about your future. Be somebody. Anybody can be nothing. It's designed to prevent juvenile delinquency. Sheriff David Davis says it's a wake-up call for kids aged 9 to 17. We've had them uh, become start stealing. We have them being disruptive at home, being disruptive in school. So their adult loved ones see something in their behavior that shows that they're going down the wrong path. So it's the intercede early to divert them uh, into a different way of thinking and a different way of behaving. What I'm trying to do is talk about those things that matter, like respecting yourself, being honest in what you do, having integrity, because ultimately those things will define who you become, and that determines whether you get a diploma, end up in a body bag, or wear a jumpsuit. Really? Once the sheriff left the jail and the bar slammed behind us, our crew was shocked at what went on. Pat your head and rub your stomach and say, I am a beast. Prisoners berating and cursing at the children. <laughs> Young girls ordered to clean the toilets of inmates without gloves. With your hands. <laughs> children thrown in cell blocks with hardened criminals, even murderers. <laughs> so in those clips you saw uh, very clearly the one mother referring to her son as inmate. Um, inmate Johnson, what is your number? And had him then recite his number. His, the entire closet was set up as a prison where he had to hang his clothes and uh, mm -hmm. he won't be able to come out unless he just to shower or to eat. So that's like a, a socialization into a prison environment. Yeah, and the idea again is um, that since an innate deviance that right. has to be beaten out of the child or also be expressed in ways that are dangerous. So the example that led Dr. Patton in many ways to write the book is the so-called Baltimore mom yeah. and the young son is engaging in the Baltimore uprising. Mm -hmm. And so there was viral video of her basically physically attacking her son to get him off the streets in the mm -hmm. midst of that uprising. Uh, basically saying that, you know, it's like, oh, he could have been killed by the cops, something could have mm -hmm. happened, and her applying this physical violence to the child was good because it got him off the streets. Mm -hmm. Now, being from Baltimore and understanding the context of that environment, you know, it was very scary, but the idea that the solution to violence by the cops is violence by the parent, mm -hmm. I think is part of what is so up for debate, you know, and it's seen as inevitable. The violence of the cops is, is inevitable. Mm -hmm. So the only solution is the physical violence from the mother when it's mm -hmm. like, we can do police accountability law. Like we can do things to actually make the cops fear a sense of getting fired mm -hmm. if you actually do the law is right. But people have been so beaten down politically that the only thing that's on the table is, well, I have to beat them before the cops do. Yeah. Because be the cops beating them is seen as inevitable. And I think we get, we get so inundated with the examples of political failure. Like, you know, the controversy over the founders of Black Lives Matter, for example, and the limits of the so-called Black Lives Matter movement. You don't know the successes that, you know, like we're having here in Maryland. Like we repealed the law enforcement officers' bill of rights, something people said could never be done. They were going to build a youth jail in East Baltimore, something they said we could never stop. And then we stopped it. Mm -hmm. But you don't hear about that. You right. hear about, oh, uh, they bought houses with the BLM money. Isn't it crazy? Yeah. And so people think, well, it's nothing we can do, so I might as well, you know. Ha it, it, this is a political conversation. The possibilities of the political horizon implicate how people parent their kids. Yeah. Because if there are things you can do, like if they need something to do, get some money and do a youth program. Like 
just advocate for the city to put some money in your community so you don't have to, you know, think, well, there's nothing, I can, no place for them to go, nothing for them to do, so I have to make sure that they are internally disciplined. Mm-hmm. But again, that's not natural for a child to, like, be so beaten down. And so it's weird. It's like because we're so afraid of violence, we're almost raving, like, people who are, like, okay with violence. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I think, and one of the things I will say, too, to something that you just said, Grand Prix, is, you know, somewhat in the defense of the Baltimore mom, as a Baltimore mom, for her, I don't think the alternative was, I'm going to beat them so the police don't beat them. I, I think she was like, I'm going to knock him upside his head so he doesn't get killed, mm-hmm. right? And I feel like that's still that still that uh, historical connection to slavery wherein if, if it's a if it's a difference between one, my child getting sold away, Mm -hmm. AKA today would be going to prison Mm -hmm. or my child being killed or lynched, the, the parent out of protection, out of feeling, feeling of protection and, and all of that is going to say, I'm going to, you know, how Mm -hmm. parents do, I'm going to hit you and I'm going to beat you in here so that you don't have that experience Mm -hmm. on the outside. And uh, Dr. Patton um, referenced a a quote that her adoptive mother would say to her that she's going to beat her in here so that she don't get beat down by the white man externally. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'll I'll say another one of the uh, uh, quotes from Dr. Patton. Um, She says, Humiliating or inflicting pain on your child's body is a social experience that reinforces society oppressive structures. Uh-oh. Uh, structures. One thing our children and courage has, uh, has them to accept violence as normal and natural, to your point that you were making earlier, Grampy, and demand respect through violence. When black folks participate in this kind of ritual, uh, violence under the guise of teaching love and protection, we are uh, colluding in the continued subordination of our race. I think that that is a very powerful statement. And then I think it's like one of the key points of uh, making those connections that this is, to your point that you were saying earlier, Grand Prix, like this is perpetuating it. This is could potentially make them feel like this is okay. This is acceptable. This is how you get respect. This mm-hmm. is how you, you know, and then it's passed down. Um, generationally. Yeah, and I think in moments of very acute possibilities of violence, Mm -hmm. it's understandable, that sort of response. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, I think Dr. Patton's point, is the celebration of it. Yeah. She was brought on media. She did the media rounds. People said, this is how you parent black youth. Yeah. And again, it wasn't give them a comprehensive ecosystem of services for them to plug into. It was knock them upside the head. Right. And so the celebration of her. And again, like, I think she was homeless. Like, yeah. her house burned down. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But people don't talk about that. They talk about, well, she beat him upside the head and got him off the streets. Right. Right. And so the idea that we need to have a comprehensive systemic reinvestment in our community has kind of been pushed aside when we have these narratives of how do we raise our children for the world that exists as opposed to how do we change the world to make one that's more conducive to fulfilling their natural humanity. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the contexts that I wanted to bring into this conversation is religious context. You know, black folks love them some, love them some Jesus, um, which is, you know, neither here nor there. But some of the things that comes up biblically around uh, child rearing reinforces, supports uh, this sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say abuse um, or physical, I'll say physical discipline. Right. So I'm just going to re- reference a few scriptures. So in Psalms 13, 24, whoever spares the ride hates their children, but one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Right. That is connected, of course, to the to the title of uh, Dr. Patton's book. Um, another reference is the rod and uh, reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bring bringeth his mother to shame. Right. Uh, another one to that enforces this. Uh, chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare his crying. You know, Mm -hmm. beat your kid when you need to beat your kid and don't stop just because they're crying. Um, There's another one. I'm not going to read. I don't think I'll read Deuteronomy, Um, but I'll read this Exodus quote, Exodus 21, 17. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. You know, all of these references historically, uh, culturally, religiously, that mm-hmm. enforces this uh, view of how we punish and interact with black bodies. Yeah, and there's a quote in the book, Dr. Patton's book, where she's actually 
And this is why these scholarly interventions can be so important. She goes into the original Greek and explains to folks that the rod in that context is not like the switch from the tree. Mm. It's the shepherd's rod. Mm. You know, shepherds have that long crook joint where, you know, the sheep are straying and you just kind of yank them back into line. Mm. It's not like beating them. Mm -hmm. It is disciplining them by keeping them within the pack, right? Mm -hmm. Keeping them within the community. And so I think that that is one of her arguments is that we need to reassert the idea that we should socialize people into pro-social communal expressions of their humanity. But the idea that the physical violence is the tool to do that mm -hmm. is what she's challenging. Because again, she argues it's essentially a mistranslation yeah. that many people are using. Also, of course, Old Testament versus New Testament, these are very different religions, and the Bible has been used as a tool of oppression just as much as it's been used as a tool of liberation. Yeah. So putting some of these historical quotes into context, I think, is something the book does pretty well, because that is the argument people make, spare the rod, spoil the child, but that's mm -hmm. all they say. They usually don't say nothing after Right. That, because it's basically, I think she says a mantra some people use to not think about the larger political implications of what's going on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I want to make two more uh, quotes here. And then this last one, I feel like is just so very much connected um, to, to everything. Uh, Dr. Patton asserts that the violence our children face from the police, the school system, the streets, and from their parents are all interconnected. And I think that that is really largely the thesis of this book and probably even, the, I would say, the, uh, this conversation. Um, another thing I wanted to re reference is uh, a quote, or not a quote, but uh, reference some information from Amos Wilson's book, uh, Black on Black Violence, uh, The Psychodynamics of Black Self-Annihilation in Service of White Domination. And in this book, of course, it's about Black on Black violence. And I don't think we think of uh, spanking, whipping, or beating our kids as Black on Black violence. Mm. But um, I think it's very relevant to this conversation. So the main thesis of uh, this book is that the... <clears throat> that the operational existence of black on black violence in the United States is psychologically and economically mandated by the white American dominated status quo. The criminalization of the African male in America is psychopolitically engineered um, process designed to maintain the dependency and relative powerlessness of African communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one thing that struck me in the book is that one of the triggers for parents physically disciplining their kids, it's obviously very heterogeneous and diverse, but one of the main ones I saw was that there's something that happens that forces a black parent to confront some of the limitations of what they can do because of poverty or racism. Mm. So even the song that's mentioned in the book is um, Ghostface Killers, um, whip me with a strap when he's talking about how he used to get beatings. Mm -hmm. And one thing he said he got beaten for was pointing out when his mother bought him um, the fake shoes, the fake pro kids, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, well, I can't afford the real pro kids. And the thought of that made her so angry that she took it out on him. Mm -hmm. You know, so thinking about these larger dynamics, like, are you really disciplining your child in a way they can understand? Are you disciplining to inculcate discipline? Mm -hmm. or, or is it an expression of frustration? Right. And I think the reality that the book tries to get to is that often it's frustration, but we don't have a political language to understand the frustration. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't afford, you, you're always complaining you want a snack, you want a snack, but I can't afford the snacks you want me to buy. Yeah. So that makes me angry. And so thinking about how I can't afford it, I want you just to stop making me think about it. Mm -hmm. So that's where the physical discipline comes in. So I think, again, that's the larger political dynamics that are at play because, again, if you're raising someone to think that black bodies are sites for violence, because that's the way that they've been treated, it, it, it's not irrational for them mm -hmm. to see other black bodies around them as sites for violence, where mm -hmm. violence solves problems. And when you see the cycle of so-called black-on-black violence in our community, is there some fundamental dynamics involved there? And, you know, somewhat jokingly, but also realistically, it's like, I don't think the kids shooting each other on the streets lacked butt weapons. Mm, right. Like, I'm just going to put that out there. Right, 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 right. So I don't think that we should start thinking about how these things might be related. Is what right. What trying to get to. No, absolutely. Uh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I want to just go back to our original 
question of how does the legacy of slavery extend to the politics of physical discipline against black children and black people. Um, and just really to think about uh, how these things are interconnected, how we have the conversation around punishment, around black people, around black bodies, around violence, and ways in which we may uh, seek to improve improve those situations. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Patton does have some recommendations in the book about a program in Milwaukee, which basically tries to engage parents who are black parents, not only, but specifically geared towards them, who may have been caught up in some um, child abuse to basically help give them some services. Now, I think the criticism of that program is that the mechanism by which they're doing that is something called a drug court. And drug courts are basically, you basically, instead of going to jail, you basically have to come in and like do a urine test like every week and they basically like preach to you. Mm. And like and if you make one mistake, they'll send you to do the whole entire, your whole entire sentence. So a lot of the people in drug mm. courts actually end up serving longer sentences than people not in drug courts. Because if mm. you're not in the drug court, you just go to jail, do half your time and get out. If you do a drug court and you make one mistake, you come and you have to do the whole time. Mm. So it's, um, we've been so colonized and limited politically that her solution to using violence as the solution, the drug court kind of uses violence as the solution, mm -hmm. the violence of going to jail. So this is unfortunately so common that we have such a limited political landscape that even when we try to like, you know, sometimes people beat their kids because they're high, but that's not the only solution. So why would the drug court be the only solution in the book? Because that's all we have access to. Mm. So really expanding the culturally competent services that talk about injected oppression, talk about uh, pre-colonial African parental practices and seeing children as sacred versus children as inherently sinned and flawed and greedy and, you know, all this other Eurocentric mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, we need more programs to do that. Mm -hmm. But you need to fund that. And you need to actually support that in terms of what you politically come out for. Right on. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's going to be all for this episode. Uh, please like and subscribe. Please visit us at lbsbaltimore.com if you want to support the work that we do. Uh, go to lbsbaltimore.com slash sustain to invest in us. And always please like, share, invest in Black Power Media so we can continue to serve you and continue to go in search of Black Power. I'll see you soon. <laughs>